Greetings, goslings, gooselings, elk gooses, and goosets. Welcome to the inaugural episode of The Great Beyonds, your new favorite goose podcast. Uh, what Joey means is thanks to all of you for tuning into our podcast, a goose adjacent show that may occasionally draw inspiration from a band we all know and love. Uh, I'm not sure I'm in the right spot. I was told this was not a goose podcast. But regardless, we're so happy to have all of you here, especially you, potential sponsor. This space could be yours. We're embarking on this podcast journey sponsorless with the easiest, least divisive subject matter we could have possibly identified, the torch. And we'll be joined by a special guest shortly, and I guarantee you'll want to stick around because Bruce has plenty to say on the topic. But first, Birdland has been buzzing lately due to some big announcements. Let's check out the news. Now look, I don't know about you guys, but I was in some serious pain the other morning. The blue balls this band gave me by teasing me with that trailer, a five minute trailer, unbelievable, slap in the face, then saying that I have to wait two and a half months to be satisfied was giving me hot flashes, and yes, I am menopausal. Um, <laughs> thankfully, we did get a taste of that album from the Spirit of the Dark Horse that'll keep me going for now, and I hope it keeps the rest of you going as well. But before we dive into that, let's talk about this trailer. Rich is Frankie Bosco, Tweaks is Terry Alfredo, my spirit animal, plus I love Alfredo pasta. Peter as Franz Petit Lupin. Franz Petit Lupin. <laughs> Jeff as Lloyd 2.0. I don't even know where that came from. Again, you know, I, he's in the band now. They just have to throw him in there. Ben simply as Kevin, which maybe should have been his real name. And Coach <laughs> as Big Earl, which was absolutely hilarious. Um, I thought they knocked it out of the park with that. Well, let's hold on now, Bruce. Because I think you're missing someone. The star of the trailer, our very own Bruce Robinson. Credited as athletic director. How did that come about? You've been training these guys for a long time? Yeah, um, funny thing is, uh, I'm the most athletic person I know. So, <laughs> you know, I made sure that most people who knew me knew that and were well aware of that. And I made the band well aware of that. Um, you know, funny story was that Trevor kind of thought he was being cute and put it on a like a rotating little uh, electronic display at one of these shows at the East Side Cafe in Norwalk back in 2016. And, you know, they all thought it was really funny. I didn't give Russo the $3 at the door. So, you know, jokes on them. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that's kind of, you know, there's a little bit of a backstory to that. Needless to say, I'm the best basketball player we know. But, um, you know, we can go into that in another episode. Besides me, of course. Um, from me, interesting but... things. Love the perms. Love the perms in Frankie Bosco and Terry Alfredo looking fire. Um, I think it's, you know, if you dig deep into Coach's posting history, which is long and riddled with emojis, um, <laughs> you'll see a lot of Vespas. And, um, <laughs> there, cool. you know, there are some things that I can reveal that will come true, that I can't reveal that, that will, you know, become <laughs> apparent in the, the ever-developing Gooseiverse. Um, so let's leave it at that. And at long last... Goose has an upcoming studio album, Shenanigans Nightclub, scheduled for release on June 4th. It's been so long since they've released a studio album, I am not even excited About anymore. About goddamn time. I am not even excited. That's all I'll say. On to the next. <laughs> yeah, the name of the album from an old interview stemming from a bar managed by Rick's uncle that provided his family with plenty of hilarious stories growing up during his childhood. And with the lyrics of Spirit of the Dark Horse, or at least how I interpret them, it seems like a very fitting tribute, so I love that about it. Uh, but guys, I mean, you guys mentioned it's been in the works for a long time. How long exactly have you been hearing about the recording of this album? I mean, uh, I, I, since I since I became a man, I, I think it was you know, <laughs> yeah. um, that first time in sixth grade. I woke up and you know, I, and that's I mean, you know, you know what I'm saying. It's right. been a long. It's time. been a long time. You've been you haven't been a man for that I, long. <laughs> so it's really, I think, like. Uh, it's almost a shenanigan in and of itself how long this has taken. Um, but, you know, I think there there's certainly some aspects to it. Um, I don't know how public this knowledge is, but it's going to be public now. The band's van was broken into in, um, in Columbus, Ohio in fall of 2019, I think, or... 18, 19, right. and a lot of the material was actually stolen. It was on a hard drive. So the band had to go back and redo some significant segments of the album. However, I think that was kind of to their benefit because it's 
given us kind of a more accurate picture of where the band is now, or I guess as fast as they're moving, where the band was, you know, at the end of 2019 or 2020. Yeah, exactly. Um, right. So it's been in the works for a long time, um, and I think. You know, you're going to hear, I haven't looked at the album liner, the, the, who's credited on everything, but I think you'll probably hear some sprinklings of musicians who have kind of been around in the Goose sphere for a while. All right, nice. Yeah, so let's run through the track list real quick. Starting off with So Ready, Into Satellite, Madhavan, Same Old Shenanigans labeled SOS, Dawn, Flow Down, Spirit of the Dark Horse, which came out, Thunder with a 7, and then the labyrinth closes it out. So I know Madhavan and Flow Down are definitely among some of the higher requested songs to be recorded in the studio, at least from me and the people that I see on El Goose. Uh, what are you guys most excited to hear? I, I love Dark Horse. Yeah. You know, I haven't heard it in so long. Yeah. It's one of the first Goose songs ever written. You can find it on Nung's 42118, 3119, but also, I mean, same old shenanigans, such a heater. I was lucky to catch one of the two times it was played at Boulder, Colorado, Lazy Dog, 13119. You know, it'll be it'll just be really interesting to see the direction that they take that in. And a lot of people haven't heard that song, so. Yeah, and people are dying for them to play these songs live. I know I have been. They're, you know, I know they're a little too scared to play same old shenanigans live, but now that they recorded <laughs> it in the studio, you know, I think it should give them a little bit more confidence. You know, and they, they're good now. You know, these, these guys can play, so um, I hope to hear it. Um, and and definitely Dark Horse. I was actually really happy to hear that Dark Horse was the first single. I know a couple a couple guys that are big fans and are, they've been on the board. Matt Gigliotti and Sam Floor created some really awesome Spirit of the Dark Horse pins. So it's great to see that the band is starting to come back and, and play this song. They put it on an album. Ideally, we get to hear it a bit this year. And, you know, for me, getting some of these things onto an album is a, is a real good step forward for the band. And I'm really excited to hear some of these sections after these songs, some of the songs that are labeled with those parentheses that I, I think it, it's going to be really interesting to see what they did with it. Yeah, exactly. You know, June 4th cannot come quick enough, but we'll be right back with our interview with Andrew O'Brien. Stick around. Episode one, baby. It's lit. Let's dive into some fire conversation. I'm ready to talk the torch and I want all the smoke. So today we have a very special guest for an interview, editor-in-chief of Live for Live Music and noted authority on band-based pyrotechnics, Mr. Andrew O'Brien. So while we have Andrew here, we're trying to touch on a couple of interesting points about the Torch conversation, such as why do we hear about the Torch so much? We also touched on its prevalence across music communities and how to manage the conversation in a constructive and educational way. It was great talking with Andrew, otherwise known as the Notorious AOB. He has such great insight into the community and such an amazing perspective on the topic as a whole. So we're really excited to bring this to you, the listeners. I mean, it was such an educational experience for me. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. All right. We are so excited to introduce our first guest ever on The Great Beyond, editor-in-chief of Live for Live Music, Mr. Andrew O'Brien. Andrew, how are you? Hey, how's it going, fellas? I'm good. You know, I wish I was able to be there in the studio with you guys, but, you know, COVID is a thing. So we're talking on a on the phone, but I'm happy to, to be in on this conversation. I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say. We're so happy uh, you could join us, and the modern marvel of technology will make this whole thing work. Amen. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> hey, amen. <laughs> modern marvel of technology. For those of you at home, Greg is holding his phone up to the microphone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Analog, I guess baby. everyone's only got audio, but there's a, a very janky setup going on. Hope I am in work. complete awe of the marvel <laughs> that we're doing here. Yeah. I'm the jam scene Steve Jobs. There you go. Okay, so we're just going to dive right into it with Andrew. So, Andrew, I had written up a couple questions for you, but just to get the conversation started, uh, I was pretty curious, given your you know your affiliation, your knowledge of a lot of different bands working for Live for Live Music, um, that it, have you noticed this concept of carrying the torch come up in other band or fan communities, or is it really primarily a goose-related topic at this point in time? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, so I've been at Live for Live for about five years, maybe six. Uh, started sort of part time, and you know, got more and more involved. 
And throughout that time, there have probably been like five or six different bands where like the public opinion is like, this is the torch. Like these, these guys are holding the torch yeah. and it's almost in my mind become like, like riffs on a, on a joke. Like it's, you know, all of them feel as though like this band is really the one that's like carrying this legacy. I really believe in this band and like in a way, all of them are, are right. And so like the fact that it's an argument, you know, it's fun to have things to argue about. We still like to argue about, you know, who's better, MJ or LeBron, but <laughs> one doesn't exist without the other. And so, right. um, or, you know, the LeBron doesn't exist without MJ. So it's hard to make those comparisons. And so it's like, it's, I have noticed that it's a, a theme that pops up frequently and it's been, I've heard it ascribed to many different bands. But I think just the, the existence of a scene where you can have eight different groups and fan bases attached to those groups arguing and passionate about the fact that their group is the one, you know, carrying that flame, that is the flame in a collective sense. You know, like the, the whole idea of it, right, started, um, you know, I guess with the Grateful Dead, right, they mixed all their influences and like, you know, made it a thing mm -hmm. and then there's this hard cutoff of the grateful dead in 95 so everyone's like all right i need to look what's the next chapter you know that people sort of recognize as being fish and then from you know that's where the conversation started right there wasn't a horse to pass off now but now that there's been sort of two big things everyone's looking for what's the third and i think mm -hmm. the logical way that things develop is that there's not going to be one single third the whole existence of a scene where there's a, a discussion is that next step for sure yeah that's that's great i mean that's and that's what i was kind of thinking is that it does seem perpetually prevalent across the board and, and in good points about the dead getting cut off really and then it just kind of naturally went to the next biggest thing and and now it's a lot of people grasping for it just to follow on that with your experience with working with writers and reviewers for all this live music, is there some sense of you as the editor in chief for, for managing these comparisons between bands with reviewers or with writers? And do you guys have some writing standards or best practices that you use regarding that? And also to follow on, do writers tend to be prone to making those comparisons or not, not so much as the regular fan? That's interesting. You know, the, the writers that we have, it's a small team. And we, we are fans, you know, it's like a, a group of us, probably much like you guys who you get on, you talk about the bands you like, right. it just so happens that we also sort of are responsible for putting out some sort of public coverage of these talks that all of us have with our groups of friends about these bands. Right. And so inevitably personal biases sneak into these things, right? Like if the reviewer is reviewing a band, like a show with two bands on the bill and one of them is their favorite band, like that's going to show up whether they want to or not in some form in whatever they're putting down. Right. But what we try to do is make sure that you get the facts of what happened. You know, we do our best. There's always, there's always, you know, room for error, but that's, that's the main goal is try to get the facts of what happened and try to get the larger context, right? What it means to people who care about it as a whole. Why, why is this interesting? Why is this noteworthy? and leave more of the, I guess what you would call classical criticism on the wayside. You know, I, I try to, because it's a subjective medium, you know, it's live music, improvisational music, you know, oftentimes it's someone writing it based on a video versus someone had a very different experience when they're there. So, you know, to a certain extent, there's no, no one's ever going to like fully capture what it was to everyone. So the best you can do is like try to make sure that you hit the facts and add, add color where you can. For sure. Yeah, it's a great point. And I'm wondering, do you sometimes sit down to write something, say, about a particular show, and kind of consciously say, I can't be a fan here. Like, I have to be, you know, somewhat critical if, you know, maybe something didn't go right. Like, I think back to Almost Famous, and, you know, mm -hmm. he hands in the article to Rolling Stone, and he says, and they keep, they criticize it basically saying, oh, this is just like a fan piece. This guy was just happy to be on tour and just happy to be there. Like, do you sometimes have to say, like, you know, I, I'm trying not to sound like a fan here, or is it, hey, I am a fan and you can deal with it? Uh, yeah, there is, there's such a, that that's the million dollar question. You know, like we have, 
you know, one contributor in particular that I'm thinking of who's, you know, he uses some very flowery, like, you know, poetic, you know, almost like fantasy fiction prose to talk about these bands in this very, you know, descriptive way because he is very passionate about how much he loves these bands. And that's one way of coming across it. You know, people, he has built himself his own following within our site of like people go to look for what this guy has to say about it because they can feel his passion for it. Yeah. For me, like, you know, writing recaps of fish shows, I know that fish fans are gonna, you know, they're looking to bust your balls and looking to be specific and, and, you know, argue and sort of debate. Right. And so if you just say everything is great, everyone's going to pay on you. Right. Because obviously, you know, even if, that's my favorite band, which you know, they probably are, right? I've seen them more than anyone. I probably know them better than any band. If I just come in and say, oh, this is all great, this is all great, everyone's going to be like, well, I don't believe you. Mm-hmm. Because I know I've seen more than one show, and I know this part wasn't as good, and I know this part wasn't as good. So it's like, you, I don't need you to prove to me that you love this band. I want an actual critical review of something that has a basis for comparison. And that sort of you know ties back into the idea of The Torch in general, where it's like, the whole reason that that concept exists is because we want to have context for what's going on right now. Right. Definitely. And that's such a, uh, just to interject, that's such a good point because, you know, this is one of the things that I see in our fan group a lot when it comes to these comparative or constructive or critical music dialogues that people want to have is that I hear a lot that, you know, people get mad at goose fans because they're always, uh, proselytizing about how much they love goose. You know, my, my, my feeling on that is that, well, they're, they're on the goose board. So of course there's going to be a lot of fans who really love them. But like, like you had mentioned that, you know, people are people, people know that, right. Or they maybe say, well, of course, you know, of course you like them, but let's actually dig in and let's actually, you know, have a, have a real critical or a knowledgeable discussion on this stuff, because obviously everything can't be the best thing since sliced bread every time. So it adds a little bit of, of credibility to it. Sure, yeah. I mean, it's it's cyclical. People get excited about things and they make claims about it. You see that too in in covering shows where like you'll be really stoked about this show last night. And then you look back at the end of the tour and maybe you read a recap of one of the first couple of shows and you're like, Oh, all right, I was really excited about this show, but it got better. And, you yeah. know, by the end I was writing about something potentially even cooler in a way more measured way. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, it, you know, it's it's an interest. It's it's interesting how it how it develops in that way. Yeah, and I think you know, there's plenty of inherent good in this, right? Most of this just is a result of people being dedicated, passionate listeners who are committed to like dissecting everything they hear. But I also, you know, exactly, yeah, I, I identify this like kind of negativity that exists with it as well, because people are so prone to comparison that it, you know, it becomes almost like a competition of who's doing this kind of torch access thing the right way. And I don't really think there's a right way to do it. Exactly. I I think, you know, getting back to what I was saying before, it's, you know, it's, it's fun to have the argument, right? It's fun to, you know, talk about, wow, what's, what's the best Marvel movie? But like, you can, that can be a valid debate that we have forever, but you still need to have had the first 10 for the next 10 to make sense. And the next 10 may be the best overall, but they still don't exist without the past one. And so it's like the obsession that we as fans have with like trying to hand that torch to someone in particular i think is where the whole argument is flawed like let's let's have this like debate for sport about our favorite bands i'm all for that like i said at the end of the day we're all right because the passing of the torch quote unquote i don't ever see it personally as being a linear one-to-one exchange you know when you're talking about passing the torch don't cares about the stick that the, the flame is on what you care about and what makes it interesting is that it's this flame that we know that we love and it's the same flame that's being maintained and being nurtured over time, that nurtured legacy, right? And so it's, you know, a flame can go ahead and light many different fuses and that can go out in many different directions and all of those can be valid heirs to whatever that legacy is that they're continuing. You know, it doesn't have to be 
a one-to-one and I don't think it ever will be. I think it'll look more like a family tree where it's like, you know, that there was, was, it's like a single singular patriarch in the dead. Right. And then there's like the heir apparent and fish. And then from there it splits off into so many, you know, branches of family trees where like fish influence all of these bands who are going to pass this torch to all of these bands. And all of a sudden, this flame that we're talking about as a singular torch is being carried by 50 bands in this sort of scene that didn't exist before. And that's the torch. Yeah. That's, so it's not, you know, it's everyone is wrong and everyone is right. Yeah. In, and, in a sense. And that's a good point. Again, I, uh, just to draw back on the board one more time that a couple of weeks ago, somebody actually posted a, meme of a bunch of birthday candles and uh lighting each candle is the dead but then you had fish and, and you know you had the dead you had somebody else probably twiddle i don't know but you know you had other bands on there and and, and honestly that made the most sense you know it's it's many of them carrying that flame and and it doesn't really it doesn't make as much sense to have just one holding on to that but um i wanted to get back to a point you made before andrew and just again you know as a writer and a reader and a conversationalist you know it is fun. You'd mentioned it's fun to compare and people like to have these conversations. Uh, it tends in the fan community to always erupt into some sort of animosity or argument. That's just not very constructive. So from your perspective as some, somewhat of an, of a language expert, you know, what would you think would be maybe the best way to approach these conversations that stirs positivity or education rather than negativity? Man, you know, I, that, that's a great question. Um, and it's, it's, to be honest, something I haven't thought about too much, right? Because as I've been explaining, my sort of gut reaction is to write off this whole argument as being, you know, it's a crutch for people to be able to understand what they're looking at, but it doesn't mean anything. Right. But right. There, it, you could, you could make it constructive like that. And I think maybe the way to do that is instead of approaching this torch concept conversation, um, you know, moving forward along the timeline. So like the dead to fish to who's next start now and work back, right? Start with a band you really love, say it's goose and then trace that lineage back through All right, Yeah. They're influenced by fish. Sure. But they're also influenced by, you know, Bruce Hornsby and they're influenced by, you know, 90s or early 2000s radio pop and like there's all all of these things and you can trace all of that back and in that you'll get a much more nuanced and accurate picture of how this quote-unquote torch is moving through time than like you know essentially a dick measuring contest about who's the best band which is always going to be I will always lose it's that a subjective contest. conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a it's conversation that never gets settled. It's tough for all of us in that in that realm. <laughs> um, I think, <laughs> I think, uh, like, kind of going back to the sports analogy, um, and me trying to look at how this, hopefully, this um, this episode drives conversation in a better direction in our fan groups. I pose this question: Is Rick the LeBron James of the jam scene? <laughs> oh man that feels way above my pay grade. <laughs> uh, i'm gonna go ahead and officially plead the fifth but <laughs> these are the kinds of conversations that like are interesting you know like if you want to get nerdy and have a debate like pose it something a little bit more nuanced than who's the next fish because that there's no answer to that question that's going to satisfy anyone and we've Definitely discussed it enough at this point. Uh, so, yeah, Andrew, one last question I guess we had is looking forward, I guess the the pandemic hasn't served well for this conversation because a lot of people aren't going in person to these shows, having discussions with people at intermission in the smoking section, anything like that. It's all been via social media, in writing, where you can't really gauge someone's intent. You can't hear their voice. You're only reading their words. Um, so I guess as a writer, how can you kind of give us advice if we want to have like a critical type of post where we want to genuinely start a conversation and not just make it about, you know, I'm just trying to piss everyone off that I possibly can. Like, how can we go about that? What do you think is a good format for us to write a critical, um, genuine opinion? That is the question, huh? It's, you know, 
the you're right the fact that all of the discourse has remained but the actual physical personal interaction part of it has been taken out of the equation it just amplifies all of the aspects of social media that we in the past few years have been starting to see as things that are wrong with our current society right and it trickles down even into fun conversations about jam bands we like which you know we all we all obviously know in the grand scheme of the world is not a pressing manner but it's something that we like to speak about right and you know on the internet especially there's always gonna be people who want to antagonize for no reason right there's trolls trolls are a thing as long as the internet's a thing and you know it's way easier to have a productive insightful conversation in person you can see someone's face and you can connect with them and know that they're being sincere so i do think some of that is lost in translation there uh i don't know what the best way to address it now is i mean i think you sort it's sort of like a, a trust of your in your audience and in your uh collective you know if we're, if we're talking specifically about goose fan group right um there's you know it, it sort of it has to be like a, a culture of that that develops over time and it's not any one thing anyone can do but a culture of like this is a place where you can voice an opinion that like or you know a theory or a feeling on something where it's not just going to get shot down and like you know you, you have to foster the environment of it which is hard to do and let, you know it's a moving target it's one of those things where it's like much easier said than done uh but it's, sure. so it's on all the fans then you know to if you want positive you know stimulating discourse about your band on your band's page you have to foster it when other people bring it up yeah you hear that listeners it's up to you <laughs> it's up to you yeah oh uh, yeah and if you don't do it i'm deleting your post and muting you and blocking you from the right. so yeah yeah, 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 yeah be positive or, or else yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Andrew, thanks for hopping on with us today. We um, are maybe one step closer to figuring out this whole torch thing. I'm not quite sure. I guess we'll have to see what happens uh, on the Internet. But I guess we'll leave our listeners with this. Be kind, because the current torchbearer of music editorial journalism told you to do so. I like that. I like that. (laughs) Just be kind, because, like, you know, everyone's bored right now and wants things to be better. And we've all had a rough year, and so we should give each other a break, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. Just Couldn't be have nice. said it better ourselves. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Well, Andrew, thanks for hopping on with us. Can't wait to see you in person at a show. Uh, you I know, know, I know, and I'm gonna come over to that studio and, and say what's up to you guys in person. Hell soon. yeah, we'd be happy to have you again. Definitely. Absolutely. All right. Well, we're gonna take a quick break, but stay tuned for our first ever merch giveaway. We're giving all of you a chance to win a few limited edition items signed by the band. Thanks, Andrew. We'll be back. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. This week, we're giving away signed Fantasy Tour trading cards to three lucky listeners. All you have to do is get involved on social media. Like and share our page on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and like and retweet us on Twitter. Our three winners will be announced on each individual platform and will have 24 hours to claim their prize. Well, that sounds exciting. Thanks, Greg. No problem, Bruce. I can't tell if you're being sarcastic or not. I absolutely am. And thanks to all of you, our listeners, for tuning into episode one. We have so much planned in the coming months, so we hope you'll continue to join us. As a reminder, this podcast is just as much ours as it is yours. Shoot us suggestions for episode topics, guests, or just to say hi at greatbeyondpodcast at gmail.com. To those of you heading to the May run, keep in touch on socials. We'd love to hear from you live on lot. The Great Beyond was engineered by Robbie Chemical at Gary's Electric in Brooklyn, New York. On behalf of my co-hosts, I'd like to thank Andrew O'Brien of Live for Live Music, our manager, Kathleen Rothschild, the mimosas were fire. Our future sponsors, please call us at 1-800-TOPLESS-TREV. That's 1-800-TOPLESS-TREV. And most of all, you the listeners for tuning in. Catch you next time on the pathway to The Great Beyond. The Great Beyond.